will wait for the next uh, audience to join, uh, which will be Sumit. Uh, he is from the um, Solex Corporation. Hi, Sumit. Hi, Cathy, how are you? I hope you can uh, hear me okay. Yes, I can hear you okay. See you okay. Your teacher is nice. <laughs> um, so I think. Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> yes, at the time when you are setting up the PowerPoint or screen, uh, let me quickly introduce. Uh, this section we have uh, Sumit from Solis. Um, he will present the topic on APIs and event streaming, duty, exploring real time, agile, and open banking for better customer experience. So, um, Sumit, yes, I can see you start to share your screen and then wait you. Yes, I can okay. see them in full screen mode. So I will pass the ball to you and I will, I will turn off my camera now. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Kathy. And thanks everybody for your time today. Uh, I hope everything is good in Hong Kong. Uh, I'm Sumit, I'm from Singapore. And uh, for the next 20, 25 minutes, I'm going to be talking about a relatively technical topic I was enjoying uh, Lisa's 23 slides. I've got 56, uh, so it'll be a lot of very quick visuals. And my role at Solus is I run the global technology team, basically all our customer-facing architects. And through this, I get to meet a lot of uh, people in fintech and learn from them. So this is more, more or less sharing those experiences and seeing how open banking, how fintechs are evolving towards the next generation of APIs, which are event-driven APIs, asynchronous APIs. And uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting duality that we observe. So for uh, the physicists out of you who, who read about Schrodinger and the uh, uncertainty principles and the wave equation and all of that, uh, quantum physics capabilities or theories. So we'll talk about the dualities and, and talk about how Schrodinger's cat is uh, related to event-driven APIs, right? So on the agenda today, we'll talk about open banking, we'll talk about APIs and their evolution to a service mesh, then to an event mesh. Uh, further, we'll look at, uh, again, trying to find Schrodinger's cat. Uh, we'll introduce you to a capability called the event portal, and then introduce a few case studies, uh, how some other uh, fintech companies, large banks, challenger banks, uh, or uh, people in the ecosystem have leveraged these capabilities to build interesting, innovative systems. So getting underway, uh, fintech has evolved into, into a very interesting pressure of innovation. So on one hand, you have the incumbents and uh, they own the customers historically, and they are uh, innovating to defend their turf. Uh, on the other hand, you have the challengers and fintech companies, virtual banks, small organizations who uh, who are changing the game, adopting newer technology and uh, becoming cloud native, becoming microservices oriented from the very start. And this whole uh, battle bot game is great for the customer. It's great for the industry because it is leading to innovation and open banking is, is one of the trends that is evolving on the back of it, right? So uh, if you see a comparison, so uh, the, uh, these infographs, again, I took them from the internet. Uh, uh, VLab is a Solus, I mean, both these are Solus customers. I won't go into the specific details of where they use Solus, uh, but uh, generally speaking, you can see like a corporate cards business evolving in a very interesting way, going after the entire ecosystem, the supply chain, the merchants, the expense uh, uh, aspects of it, the purchasing, uh, integrating with e-commerce stores, et cetera. So what used to be a traditional banking and card space itself is evolving. Like pick your favorite bank, HSBC, Citi, Standard Chartered, we are seeing the same evolution. On the other hand, you have challenges such as uh, virtual banks. So VLab uses Solus quite a bit as their backbone. I'll talk about it uh, further. But uh, having uh, a, a delightful customer experience, having uh, various products rolled out in an agile manner, and their, their innovations uh, competing with each other 
are leading to get great results. However, when we talk to most IT companies, like when they say that, okay, this is where I want to be, but is this how my IT looks like, right? Is this like a mothball and entangled mess of applications which were, were built over time? They were never designed to be this way, but that's how evolution often happens, right? You, you start with a nice design and layer after layer and under time pressure, you have to roll something out and the architectures start to give way and eventually a complex uh, ecosystem evolves out of that, right? Why does this happen, right? This happens because if you look at your business, if you look at anything in the universe, it's a series of events, right? So everything from applying for an account, that's an event. A customer came to a channel, uh, self-serve or, uh, uh, or, uh, or bank serve channel, an account application is an event. A uh, mobile phone getting activated is an event if you want to have like ecosystem partnerships with, uh, with the manufacturers. A car getting unlocked. So we, we do a lot of this with uh, connected car platforms, but that's an event, right? Uh, can you make meaning out of that event? Can you do interesting things if you tap that event and decided to process it? Uh, a credit card getting swiped is an event, right? So whenever you are at a point of sale system and you swipe a credit card, can you make meaning out of that event? Does it just have to be a request reply API for card authorization? Can loyalty systems tap that event and do something meaningful? Can inventory systems tap that event and be, uh, be meaningful in their uh, processing? Can you have uh, a... a a quality check or a fraud check or a risk check system, all of these get a copy of that event in parallel. And all of these systems could make meaning from that event and could generate more events. So each API, if you see an invocation, why does it have to be request reply? It is after all an event which can be processed in parallel, asynchronously, multiple things at the same time, right? Uh, a flight taking off is an event. In fact, it's a very complex event. So we work with a few airlines and all sorts of things from ground operations to flight operations to baggage to customers, passengers. Uh, the outcomes of this event is massive, right? But were they built in an event-driven way or were they also built in a service-oriented uh, uh, or, or evolved into a request reply API paradigm, which which was par for the course when it was done, but is it sufficient today, right? So I think you've guessed the theme, a modern business as you're digitizing the modern business, should it not be able to react to these business events in real time, right? But why is this not obvious, right? Uh, everything around us is an event, but we've built systems in a very, request reply, a very batch-oriented manner in the previous eras. Our technology wasn't designed for real time. And there are real reasons for it, right? So if you just look around, uh, till about four or five years ago, the predominant way of listening to music, now I digress, we used to listen to our music using MP3 players, using iPods, using uh, uh, application CD drives, etc. Our music used to be on disk, not real time, like downloaded, stored, and then processed. Today, most of us are listening to our music on music streaming services. And the reason is the evolution in the network, the underlying hardware, disks are no longer faster than network. Right? Till about 2010, uh, disks were faster than network, more bandwidth. Now, even mainstream network, and this is going to get even further with 5G, but uh, the LAN networks and all are faster than disk. So as a result, the real-time nature of transactions, rather than relying on databases or logs or all of those systems, relying on the network as you push towards real-time architecture with event streams is a possibility, and a lot of these innovators are using it, right? So. Furthermore, the value of your data diminishes over time. Now, this is a Gartner picture, 
uh, as you can see here, if you uh, if you process your data faster, it is much more valuable. So the data value on the y-axis exponentially declines over time. Not to say that data is not useful here in the traditional batch businesses, but if you can get to it faster, if you can extend an offer to a customer when that API was triggered, because your event streams were being processed in parallel in real time, you can unlock the value of, date, of your data by setting it in motion as event streams. All right, so said a lot, and I'm gonna get a bit more technical from here, but uh, this is how we are seeing the evolution of banking, uh, especially open banking and event-driven banking, that uh, what used to be very point-to-point -point message queues or point-to-point -point interactions uh, evolved to become ESBs, service-oriented architectures and APIs, and it's now evolving to be event-driven microservices, fine-grained microservices in a published subscribe manner interacting with each other subscribing to events that are happening in parallel. APIs as invocations uh, and events for internal communication. So looking at it in a bit more detail, what is an API? So I was presenting at another uh, CIO banking event um, last year, actually, when flights used to fly. And uh, this, this was one of my uh, co-presenters there, and she put up this a uh, beautiful explanation, very simple explanation of what APIs are, that uh, our connectors are connecting into these APIs for getting electricity. Now, whether it's a television or a phone charger, you plug them and uh, that's the API that the connector speaks and the electrical outlet uh, exposes. You may have a lot of complexity here. Uh, this could be your core banking systems, but you're exposing that functionality through an API. All good. Fantastic, right? Having said that, we are not doing a request reply polling for this current. We are plugging into the API and we are letting the API stream events to us, right? Furthermore, we, are, we may be streaming events back into these APIs. So while APIs are our good endpoints, our invocation mechanisms to get a hold of uh, the functionality behind them, they are great for north-south traffic and they are also evolving to become event-driven, very push-oriented. While for east-west traffic, and I'm going to elaborate more of this, for east-west traffic, that means once an account opening request comes in, once a credit card swipe API comes in, how do the systems that uh, make that happen, how do those microservices interact with each other? That's the whole east-west traffic that we're talking about. So, if I look at, like, talked a lot about banking, if I look at another industry, just to draw a reference, uh, any point of sale system, let's say you, you bought ice cream from a store and you did a modern implementation of uh, your order management flow, and all of these steps are microservices that are talking to each other, right? How are they talking to each other? Each of these microservices, these discrete functional blocks, and they might even be exposed by APIs, by REST endpoints, but they are consuming the API invocation or the event from the upstream, doing their business logic, producing the event as an outcome. So the store could be sending, let's say, a new order to buy an ice cream. The validator subscribes to new orders, so all publish subscribe, nobody's calling anybody, subscribes to a new order, does the validation, publishes the valid order event. Then the credit check picks up all these, listening to all the valid orders, uh, ensures that uh, there is that the credit is fine, and then publishes that, yes, this is a valid credit. And then similarly, the inventory check microservice picks that order up, so all loosely coupled, talking over an event broker, talking over an event mesh, right? And all of these steps are in line, more like a request reply paradigm. So I consume, I do my piece, publish the next, and the daisy chain basically keeps happening till I get to the order processor who says that, okay, I process this order and I can return to the point of sale system. All of this 
happens in microseconds, right? Then there are other consumers, insight consumers, cross-sell, upsell, data lakes, insights, audit, logging, risk, fraud, all of these consumers also want to get a copy of that data. Now, if you look at this picture, you had an API invocation here coming in, a synchronous request reply API. These steps in green were the synchronous steps for that North-South API invocation. That's the East-West logic, right? So you entered the, uh, the systems, these microservices are all consuming uh, each other's uh, outputs and they are happening in sync. So once we are at the end of the payment processor, that message is returned back to the store while all the black components, they don't have to be in line. So that's the beauty when you go for asynchronous patterns, you go for asynchronous APIs, rather events in this case, that all of these black pieces can happen in parallel, queuing and guaranteeing the delivery of these uh, events to these services is taken care of by this middleware, this event broker or mesh that we are implying, we haven't defined yet. And uh, the, the sync path is nicely talking to the async path. What you get as a result is much faster response time because these slower consumers, they are not in line anymore, right? They are just sitting on the side, waiting for uh, the events to be sent to them. And if they are a couple of seconds late, if the data lake got the message two seconds late, what's the big deal? You want your green flow to be very, very fast. So patterns such as eventual consistency, deferred execution are possible when you have your east-west traffic handled as events while you're north-south traffic, which is the basic invocation as an API, right? And again, uh, this is what Gartner has also been talking about. Uh, this is a Gartner picture where uh, apps, the north-south traffic comes in as an API, and then all the microservices are consuming events from there, right? So looking at it in comparison with a traditional service-oriented architecture, uh, comparing ESBs and API gateways and how they are evolving, so rather than doing orchestration where like back in the day, these were web services, now they have become uh, microservices and rather than them talking over rest, like all creating a distributed monolith, which often becomes a bottleneck, both from a performance and an agility standpoint, why don't we go and modernize them? We flip the responsibilities such that we use this notion called the event mesh. And what is an event mesh? It's it's the capability what traditionally used to be messaging, uh, message queuing, but uh, it's publish, subscribe, distributed routing, choreography, the ability to choreograph events in a publish, subscribe manner, right? Uh, by the way, that's what Solace does, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, uh, but the event broker is this capability, this, uh, this piece of software or even hardware or a cloud service that you would run. It talks all of these open standard protocols. So if you're writing Spring microservices, you connect using a Spring binder, you can talk to it over Node. Devices could talk to it over REST or MQTT. And it has this concept of topic routing. And this is not a new concept, like the global FX backbones have been using it or equities backbones have been using it for 20, 25 years. Like TIPCO RV uh, very famously has been deployed in so many ecosystems with this. But if you published an event, let's say this is a payment and event initiation in Singapore, version one of your payload, the channel was QR code, the bank in question was DBS bank. It was a CASA uh, account and I paid for a taxi for the company Comfort. Now, this could be a REST URL that got pushed as an API, and my microservice could be consuming this over uh, asynchronous like JMS or AMQP or MQTT protocols using wildcards. So what we are saying is, give me all payment initiation events originating in Singapore of the version one. It does not matter what channel, what bank, what account, what I paid for was there in that event. 
I published this URL, give it to me that, right? Or I can even wildcard and I can say, I don't even care about whether it was Singapore or Hong Kong, as long as the channel was QR code, give it to me. Right, so fairly technical. You can you can uh, visit uh, our development website or we can take questions, but uh, let's see how this is put together. So my payment microservices are going to be, again, some for version one, some for different countries, et cetera. But for illustrative purposes, simple, simple microservices comes in, REST URL is published, it matches that subscription. And again, guaranteed delivery is possible, parallel delivery is possible, load balancing is possible. So you can use Solace as an event mesh. And why we say mesh? Because this can be in your data center, it can be in your laptop, it can be in any cloud, and all of these are networked with each other. It's a network mesh of brokers, purely distributed, so that let's say your B2B channel could also be publishing the same event over a different protocol, and the protocol translation will be taken care of by this mesh. Again, could be globally distributed. This channel could be in Hong Kong, this could be in Singapore, and it'll all work, right? Now, if you elaborate it further, what you're seeing here is choreography. There is no ESB which is saying, do this and do that, right? Full choreography, microservices are attracting the events that they care about such that I can have a new analytics microservice which cares about, let's say, only QR code events. So let's say we launched a new capability for QR code payments, and that's the only thing that we care about. We don't care about which bank, so we put a star there as a wildcard. We don't care about which version. This campaign analyzer can handle everything. So the next payment initiation event that got published will now get delivered to both of these systems, right? So my north-south traffic coming as an API gets handled as events in parallel, load balanced, throttled, guaranteed in a globally distributed manner using the event-driven paradigm, using the event mesh, right? Now, I could front my north-south traffic with an API gateway, and I may have legacy systems, my ESBs, my mainframes, my old systems, which because this event mesh speaks JMS, you can easily plug and play. You can have MQ adapters, which uh, are all provided, database adapters are provided. So your old world talks to the new world and gradually you can start migrating your old world so that uh, it's not a big bang, but it's an, it's an evolution that you gradually uh, make happen towards modernizing your core platforms for them to be truly agile and truly distributed. So again, lots of detail here, but to give you an example, how a typical bank could think about these things. So as you've seen, we've used events and we've tagged events with these topics or REST URLs. If you spend some time, and these are all dynamic topics, if you spend some time, and this is based on some of our customers, uh, for a bank, you could have a domain like cash, retail, securities, wealth, et cetera. Then the categories under that domain, subcategory, which country, version number, the verb, like are you creating an account? Are you processing a payment? So you think of your taxonomy and it starts to look like this, that uh, it's a sunburst chart from the center going outwards, transactions and orders and portfolio. And again, it doesn't have to be a bank. For a telco, you will have your own domains. For a manufacturing company, your own domain, and this whole wildcarding logic basically works. So for example, uh, processing DDIs across various countries, uh, you can have uh, enumerations there. You just have to remember it's a slash separated string and wildcards in it. That's it, nothing more than that. And with that, applications are just attracting what they care. So. Going back to the evolution of APIs, so we talked a lot about events and event mesh for north south for east east west traffic. For uh, north south traffic, service mesh is a great evolution for APIs, and as we've seen uh, for uh, the microservices architectures to evolve, UIs which were pushing into all of these microservices architecture, uh, sidecar starts to come in, 
next to them so that uh, they can be uh, independent of the communication pieces, uh, decoupling using the sidecars. And that is provided by the service mesh, right? So again, good evolution for coupled microservices to become loosely coupled with the sidecars. But then what do you do for asynchronous traffic? What do you do for uh, uh, parallel traffic? All the, the traffic that we talked about. And that's where the service mesh and the event mesh coexist. So your APIs, request reply, uh, north, south, are best served with the service mesh, event mesh for asynchronous, parallel, throttled, east-west traffic. Both are globally distributed, and then there are hybrid ecosystems that are created. So looking at a, looking at a few case studies, so NETS, again, it's a public reference we can talk about. NETS is the backbone of all payments in Singapore, so about 110,000 payment terminals, ENETS, et cetera. It's owned jointly by all the three major banks in Singapore. So they use Solace as their backbone, the same concept that I talked about. So an event comes in as an API, through an API gateway, has the topics that we talked about. Each of the banks will have their own topics, uh, which they would subscribe to. Again, loyalty could be subscribing by customer and not by bank. And when they had to support WeChat, all they have to do is implement a gateway for WeChat for settlement and all of that, and ask WeChat to publish the topic, publish the URL with vPay in it, and nothing else changes. Like no orchestration chain, no API, uh, gateway had to be reprogrammed, no ESP. You brought in a microservice, you started to listen to the correct topic, and off you go, right? Hello, Sumit. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, uh, I think uh, your presentations are great. And then uh, I think you uh, still have maybe one or two cases you want to go. Uh, but yes. Just that our time is seems to be running out. Uh, no, I'll so... be finishing in two minutes. If that is yes. okay, one minute. Okay, sure, sure. Please go on yeah. for, uh, for the rest of one yeah. minute. Yeah. So, so VLab, again, as I said, also runs on Solace. And uh, we've explained it. But... Uh, uh, Here's another view, right? So open banking through platform universe, fully based on the same technology. But then how do you look inside this, right? So what's the governance around it? So that is where the event mesh has this capability called the event portal. So all your discovery, all your, and this works with Solace topics. This also works with other middlewares such as Kafka. So you can visualize your entire event streams in this manner that uh, uh, you can have your QR code scanners, your payment engines, the gray pieces are the events, the green pieces are the microservices. And this is free for you to try, you can check it out. Uh, that's, that's basically what we offer, uh, the visualizations are there. So like a very, very open and transparent mechanism for you to see what your event-driven architectures are. Right. So again, just to mention Solace, this is my last slide. We are a Canadian company and we've been there, lots of customers using us. And by the way, Solace is free for you, free for production. You can optionally pay us support. It runs on all kinds of cloud platforms. 10,000 messages per second are free. And you can check us out at solace.dev where you can download your copy. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Sorry for good being over. You know, it's a very nice example. So as what uh, Sumit has said, you can visit their developer website. They can take your questions. And also, uh, please do feel free to reach out to our speakers. And thank you so much for uh, Sumit's uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you.